Hi, everyone. I'm here with Dr. Isabella Wentz, and uh, I wanted to give her a little proper introduction here before we get started. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting her several months ago, and I'm just a huge fan of her work. She's an awesome person, and she is doing absolutely brilliant work in the realm of Hashimoto's and, and hypothyroidism. And I'm so excited and honored to have her here to speak on that subject and to share her brilliance with you all. So with that, uh, welcome, Isabella, and uh, I'm, I'm honored to have you here. Ari, I'm so excited to be here with you. I'm such a fan of your work, and I really appreciate the work that you're doing for people with fatigue. That was, that was my struggle for almost a decade, and I just really, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Cool. Thank you. And, and the feeling's mutual. I'm, I'm super impressed with the way that you're putting the pieces together uh, around Hashimoto's and especially your safety theory, I thought was super cool. So I, I love what you're doing. I know that you are a New York Times bestselling author. You have the Root Cause book. You have a new book coming out, the Hashimoto's Protocol, and you have a documentary. So you're doing so many big things just to evolve our state of understanding on this subject. And I'm just super appreciative of all the work you're doing. Thank you. You know, when you're fatigued for almost a decade, you have to make up for lost time, I guess, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, seems like you're doing a good job of it. Yeah. So um, let's get right into it. So the first question I have for you is, how did you originally get interested in this subject? How did you come to kind of find that interest for the thyroid and, and Hashimoto specifically? So in full disclosure, I was never really interested in the thyroid during pharmacy school. There were so many other conditions that had much more interesting drugs that I could give to people. <laughs> um, for thyroid conditions, we pretty much, for an underactive thyroid, we had just one drug. And I didn't quite get why people would continue to struggle. They would come to the pharmacy and they, they'd struggle with their health. And I'd be like, well, you're already taking the medication. And there was really nothing else that I could do for them. And that was what I was taught. It was like, you have a thyroid condition, you get on this drug, and yeah, it's, it's resolved, and, and that, that's all you need to do. And when I got diagnosed myself with Hashimoto's in 2009, after almost a decade of some pretty debilitating symptoms, including the kind of fatigue that kept me sleeping for 12, 13 hours a night and prevented me from really following my dreams starting at age 18, I, um, I, I kind of got it. And I was like, wow, there is nothing really for people with this condition from a lifestyle perspective other than to take thyroid hormones. And I wanted to figure out what I could do from my, a lifestyle perspective to get myself better. I wanted to be the healthiest person with Hashimoto's that I could be. And I also had this like secret inkling or feeling or maybe I thought I was a little bit crazy. And, um, and I didn't really tell anybody at first, but I was like, what if I put this puzzle together and what if I could reverse the condition and then maybe I could help other people who are struggling as well because I'm a smart cookie. I, I could figure this out. And yeah. so that's how I became a Hashimoto's expert slash human guinea pig. There was nothing really out there to help me from my conventional training, from my conventional doctors. So I stepped out of my comfort zone and started to really peel back the layers of, of my own health and researching and got myself on the path back to healing. Yeah, that's super cool. I just as a, as a quick aside, I've actually read your work. I, I read Root Cause, uh, I think two years ago, maybe three years ago. And, uh, and the reason why is uh, I had a few uh, people that I was working with who had Hashimoto's and I wanted to understand it better. And so I read that book. I read, you know, a bunch of other books on the subject and I went and explored the research firsthand. And, and you know, like you said, I, I basically discovered that there isn't really much out there other than, you know, take thyroid hormones. And yet, you know, when you read the research, you, you find inklings of stuff that may suggest, hey, maybe this lifestyle factor might affect things. Maybe this one might affect things. And it's kind of insane that we are operating in this framework where we're not really looking at any of the lifestyle factors. We're just saying, oh, you have low thyroid hormones. Here's some thyroid hormones, you know, so... I think what, what you're doing by putting the pieces together is just, just brilliant. So can you tell me a little about how common Hashimoto's is? And is there a distinction between, you know, hypothyroidism? Sometimes you hear people say hypothyroidism. Sometimes it's Hashimoto's thyroidism, hypothyroidism. So is there a difference between these two things? What's, what's the deal there? Hmm. It, it, you know, it's kind of a 
common question I get and people, I tell them, they ask what I do. And then I'm a, I say, I'm a pharmacist and they say, which, which Walgreens do you work at? And I say, I don't work at a Walgreens and I you know, have to get back into that. I help people with Hashimoto's recover their health and I'm an author and I write books on the subject. And they're like, oh, that's so nice that you've taken on this mission of a very rare disorder. You must have like five clients and 10 readers, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then I start talking about thyroid hormones and how many people take them in the United States. So thyroid medications were the number one prescribed drug over the last three years, um, two of the last three years. I think they got beat out by Vicodin last year. And they are given to people who have an underactive thyroid, right? 97% of the time, people who have an underactive thyroid, their thyroid became underactive because of Hashimoto's. So Hashimoto's is an autoimmune condition that impacts the thyroid gland. So what's happening is the immune system starts to recognize the thyroid gland as a foreign invader and begins to launch an attack. Over time, the person will have a destruction of their thyroid tissue to the point where they will become hypothyroid, where their own thyroid gland won't be able to make enough thyroid hormone unless they take external thyroid hormone. Now, the thing about Hashimoto's is that it's a multi-stage process. So there's five stages to it. Most people don't get diagnosed until stage four when their thyroid gland has been destroyed to the point where 90% of it is gone and they just need to be on hormones. Scary thing is stage five is when we start progressing into autoimmune, other types of autoimmune conditions. And thyroid hormones don't do anything to stop that progression. And so if we could back up, if we could go to stage two, which is the first clinical stage where we start having an infiltration of the immune, ce immune cells into the thyroid gland. Um, and we can also find this through thyroid antibody testing. That's the, first, that's the stage when people start having symptoms. That's when the immune system imbalance happens. And if we could find a person in that stage, we can prevent a decade, sometimes 20 years of suffering, and we can prevent the need for thyroid hormones. Um, and going back to your question, how common is it? So using more advanced diagnostic methods, we're looking at 27% of our population um, within the United States that has Hashimoto's. And the more advanced testing will uncover it. If you just do the TSH test, which will find thyroid disorders at stage four, you're going to miss it. Wow. 27% of the entire population in the U.S.? Yes. And, and women are more commonly affected. So for every man affected, there's five to eight women. Wow. That's crazy. I had no idea it was that common. It's very common when you use more advanced diagnostic methods. So the TSH test, that's not going to be abnormal until likely stage four of Hashimoto's. And it takes anywhere from, like I said, uh, 10 to 20 years to get between stage two and four. And in stage two is when we start seeing thyroid antibody tests. And these are thyroid peroxidase antibodies, TPO, and thyroglobulin antibodies, TG. And I always recommend that a person get a blood test for those because those will indicate that the immune system has started to recognize the thyroid as a foreign invader. We used to think that about 80% 80 80 of people with Hashimoto's had those antibodies, but now that we've backed into it, we're seeing that there's also something known as seronegative Hashimoto's where you don't have the antibodies, but you do have the attack on your thyroid gland and a lot of times you could see this on a thyroid ultrasound. Now, one of the reasons could be because there's a dozen of different potential antibodies you could have in Hashimoto's, but realistically, clinically, we're only testing for two or three of them when there's probably 12 that have been discovered and probably 100 other types of ones. There's different parts of the thyroid that could be attacked. And then another thing is when they studied the thyroid tissue of people with thyroid nodules, and looked, under it, looked at it under a microscope, they found that a significant amount of those people actually had Hashimoto's too. So when you look under a microscope, it's like beyond the ultrasound, you could still find additional cases. Wow, that's crazy. So you mentioned that there's advanced testing. So what's kind of the standard testing and how does that differ from the, the advanced testing that you're talking about? So the, uh, the standard testing, as you know, is the thyroid stimulating hormone test. And this is the test that most people will get when they come to their doctor and say, hey, I have um, all these symptoms. I'm tired. I'm having trouble losing weight. And they'll say, well, let's test your thyroid. And unless you're going to our friend, 
Dr. Alan Christensen, <laughs> they will only do one test and then they'll say, your thyroid was normal. Now, the challenge with that is, of course, we know that TSH is going to be the last thing that is going to be affected. And so that's going to miss it. And the other, the other thing is here that when scientists first determine the reference range of the TSH, they have people within the pool of healthy blood that actually had thyroid disease. So we ended up with this really lax reference range. And you, people who had a TSH of eight were getting told that it was normal, where for a woman of childbearing age, you want to be between 0.5 and 2. And most women really feel best when they're in that level. I personally feel best when my TSH is at a 1. When it was at a 4.5, I was a sloth. And I was told that my thyroid was normal, right? Right. Yeah, the reference range is, is huge. What is it? It's like 0.5 to 4.5 for, for most people. You know, yeah, I mean. There's slightly different reference ranges depending on different doctors. But I, I think it's somewhere around there, right? It depends on the lab. And so, you know, when I was going to complaining about my, my symptoms every year, the reference range was pretty lax. So it was, I have one lab test that I think it, it was up to eight and I was testing at 4.5 and five and they said, that's fine. Now <laughs> recent labs are more closer to 4.5. Um, the endocrinologist association would like to see it at 3.5. I'd like to see it no higher than two. So for anybody so, that gets those tests, get a get your own copy and you know do your own cross checking. Yeah. So you're saying if something is, you know, the, the standard test is just TSH. They're not testing any of these other you know antibodies or or uh, uh, some of the other aspects of thyroid hormone. Um, but you're saying if it's showing up as above normal TSH, then it's already like well into the progression of the disease. Is that correct? That's correct. So a TSH between 2 and 10 is going to be at stage 3, and then above 10 is considered generally stage 4. Gotcha. And at that point, it's, is it much harder to start to reverse it once it's progressed to that level? Right. It's, it's going to be harder to reverse it when it's more progressive. When you think about what's happening in Hashimoto's, we have this damage on the thyroid gland, and we can stop it, but the damage, it's, it's so much easier to prevent destruction of an organ than it is to regrow the tissue. But we do have some ways to do that. Interesting. Maybe we can get into that a little mm -hmm. bit later. Um, I want to step back a little bit because we're talking about some of these advanced diagnostic tests. But um, beyond actually getting these tests, is there a way through symptoms that someone could start to maybe suspect that they might have hypothyroidism? Oh, definitely. Um, the only word of caution here is that the symptoms can be very nonspecific. Mm -hmm. So thyroid hormones have receptors in every cell in our body. So we end up having like, you know, anxiety could be a symptom, whereas that can be a symptom of a dozen other things. So the most common symptoms that people are going to report are going to be fatigue. So number one is I'm tired. <laughs> oh my goodness. Like I just want to take naps all the time. I don't want to get out of bed and everything is, is a big effort. And the other big symptom is going to be weight gain or an inability to lose weight. When I was first diagnosed, I was, didn't change anything, didn't change my diet, didn't change my workout schedule, sleep schedule, nothing changed. And all of a sudden, all my sweatpants were getting really tight. I was like, how is this happening? Why, why can't I not put on my sweatpants? And that's pretty common for women is they'll just find that the weight starts creeping up. It just creeps up, creeps up, creeps up until all of a sudden they're like, oh my goodness, I'm eating like a bird and I'm looking at the scale and, and it's like, it's not working. I'm just putting on more and more weight. And then the other big struggle that, um, that I personally had, and I know a lot of women have had in a greater, um, much more devastating way than I have is effects on the brain. So I had brain fog where I couldn't remember things. My, um, my husband used to like tease me. He'd be like, oh, we know how your memory is. And I was like, no, I'm, I'm like sharp and smart. But that was like the old me. Mm. And then the other thing is um, depression or apathy where a person is going to just feel oh, like I don't really care. They, they have a hard time making decisions or they're just not as excited about life as they used to be. They might withdraw socially. They're not going to want to spend time with their friends. It's just too much of an effort. Mm -hmm. And then we also have seen, um, I had this personally, anxiety and panic attacks. 
Um, I have had some clients, unfortunately, who had misdiagnoses of bipolar disorder. And I've even had some clients who were hospitalized with um, like psychotic disorder and misdiagnosed because the difference between like Hashimoto's and hypothyroidism, which we touched on a bit, is if you just, let's say you just removed your thyroid gland and that's it, you didn't have a thyroid anymore, you would just go directly into like the sluggish symptoms. You'd be putting on weight, you would be losing hair, you'd be tired, you'd be just basically sluggish. With Hashimoto's, you actually end up with symptoms from the grave spectrum or the hyperactive spectrum as well. So irritability, palpitations, being aggressive, being anxious. Mm. Some people may lose weight. Um, these are going to be present as well um, because as the thyroid gland is under attack by the immune system, we start breaking down our own tissue that contains thyroid hormone and this kind of gets dumped into the blood. And so you, you've got like this, woo, holy cow, I've got like all this extra thyroid hormone and then that gets cleared out. And for me, that presented as like panic attacks where I was, um, my husband used to run ultra marathons and he would go out running and it was, um, he'd be like, I'd be back, I'll be back in an hour. And then I would be like watching my clock. It was an hour and five minutes. And he would say he wouldn't be back. And so I'd call like the hospitals in the area. I'd call the non-emergency police number and ask if there had been any accidents, if any runners had collapsed from a heart attack, if any runners had been hit by a car. And then when they were like, no, there was nothing like that. I'd be like, oh, he must have met another woman and ran off with her. <laughs> <laughs> and like if it really I like believe this and like I would take our little dog out and like go look for him it was just it was nuts wow. and so I'd have these like panic attacks um, and that was the manifestation for me for other people they might have like mood swings and bipolar disorder like symptoms or even even psychosis which I'm lucky I didn't have but uh, it just angers me because so many people get placed on antipsychotic medications all these horrific things that do more harm in the long term. Yeah. Then. And then there's always fertility issues. And I know as a new dad, that's close to your heart, but um, mm -hmm. women who have thyroid disease are going to have higher rates of um, miscarriage and infertility. And I've, I've had women who were told they would never be able to have children. And it, lo and behold, it was because their thyroid was out of balance and once you address um, either the need for thyroid hormone and reduce the thyroid antibodies, they're having babies, they're having miracle babies. And it, you know, it's, it's, it's beautiful. Yeah, that's awesome. So let's say somebody's having a, a number of these kinds of symptoms and kind of take me through a couple different scenarios so that they're having these symptoms and let's say they just go to you know, their, their family doctor or you know, an endocrinologist or something, they get tested. What does the conventional approach look like and how does that differ from what you would do? Mm -hmm. So generally, if somebody was to be diagnosed with a thyroid condition by an endocrinologist, they would say, okay, depending on what your TSH number is and depending on the endocrinologist, they would either place you on levothyroxine, synthetic thyroid hormone, or not. <laughs> and then they would say, we're going to have you come back. Um, every few years or next year, whenever, to figure out and test you for additional autoimmune conditions. And because once you have one, you're likely to have another one. Um, you know, sometimes if you're in the earlier stages, in like stage two or three, when your TSH is still under 10, some of the older school ones will say, we'll just wait and watch and we'll let your thyroid burn itself out and then we'll put you on replacement. And, and then, oh, you're, you're depressed? You should go see a psychiatrist or or you're struggling with your weight oh hmm you know maybe maybe eat less and exercise yeah, maybe more. Eat less yeah I would, and i was going to say if if you don't have tsh levels are that are um high enough to be diagnosed with hypothyroidism you know as you were kind of saying a minute ago you might get antipsychotics or antidepressants or, or something of that nature is, is that correct yeah, you, you definitely, you know, will get, so in some cases, if you go to a primary care doctor, they might prescribe the antidepressants for you. For the antipsychotics, they would refer you usually to a psychiatrist. Um, I personally got offered a lot of interesting drugs. Um, I had been just a newly graduated pharmacist at the time, and I got offered, let's see, um, anxiety medications, antidepressants, and then stimulants. Wow. So, stimulants. Yeah. 
for, for, for the fatigue or something like that? Exactly. I was like, I'm just so tired all the time. And they were like, antidepressants. I'm like, but I'm not really depressed. They're like stimulants. And I didn't take them. I was concerned. I, I knew they were habit forming. Uh -huh. And I felt like, oh, man, there's got to be, there's got to be something else. And, and then, you know, as, as you likely, a lot of your clients will probably show they, um, when you're fatigued, there's really like not a good answer. And when you start looking at, or at least when I did 10 years ago, it was like, okay, um, chronic fatigue syndrome, there's nothing that can be done. And I sort of almost was like in denial for a while where I was like, oh, well, maybe I'm not fatigued. Maybe it's normal to be sleeping 12 hours a night at age 24. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. So how does so that's a conventional approach. How how does that differ from the way that you would analyze those test results and and the kinds of things you would think to do once you get those test results? Right. So if I saw somebody with an elevated TSH, I would for sure recommend that they get on thyroid hormones right away to address the imbalance and deficiency in their body. Um, oftentimes, I would generally recommend natural desiccated thyroid hormones or a combination of T4, T3, or even glandulars in some cases, depending on the person and what their numbers were and how they tolerated various interventions. The, um, the standard of care is levothyroxine, and this is T4. This doesn't always turn into the more active thyroid hormone into, into the body. That's known as T3. And so the natural desiccated thyroid and combination meds have both of those as do glandulars. And so that's where I would um, usually think about, okay, let's make sure if this person has an elevated TSH, let's make sure they have enough thyroid hormone on board and that'll help them start feeling better right away. And then um, if they have elevated thyroid antibodies, regardless if they had um, an elevated TSH or not, I would be really thinking about incorporating lifestyle to start reducing those antibodies. We know that the greater they are, the more aggressive they are. And then I would also, of course, besides looking at the labs, I would be primarily focusing on the person's symptoms too. Like, what are you going through? What are your three biggest struggles? And how do we get you to start feeling better really fast? And for me, a lot of times that looks like supporting the liver, supporting the adrenals and supporting the gut. And I do this with um, nutrition, um, various nutrients. So giving people like high dose of nutrients that usually wakes them up and gets things moving for them. And oftentimes um, targeted herbs and protocols. We, we can, you know, get into as deep detail as you want. Yeah. So tell me a little more about some of the root causes of why someone would get Hashimoto's and, and, and kind of what's, what's underlying this. Like why, why does all of a sudden the body's immune system start attacking the thyroid gland and the body starts producing less thyroid hormone? What's, what's the root cause here? So some of the more common root causes are going to be food sensitivities, nutrient depletions, an impaired ability to handle stress, um, toxins that you can't handle, um, intestinal permeability, and then um, chronic infections. And the way, you know, I've been thinking about this for a while, and this is the kind of stuff that keeps me up at night, trying to connect all these little puzzle pieces. And I thought about it, why do more women have thyroid disease? And, you know, when does it happen? And why do these different things trigger it? Why do these different things cause it? And then I came across a research study from a few years ago about the thyroid actually having the potential to sense danger and then sending out danger signals to the rest of the body. And I was like, that's it. The thyroid gland, it's a butterfly shaped gland, but it's, it's really our, the, you know, the canary in our coal mine that is responding to the toxins in our environment before everybody else does to give us a signal. If, so, by the way, if it, if it was shaped like a canary, somebody would have had this realization a lot sooner than you. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. I'm like, well, it, maybe it's kind of shaped like a canary. And, and I try to play <laughs> around with some Photoshop. I'm not, I'm not really good. So I kind of left it alone. But yeah, it's definitely a, an environmental sensing organ. So it's going to be figuring out whether we're safe or not. And why it's really relevant for women is few reasons um, why we have more, more cases of autoimmune thyroid disease in women. But one of them is that um, obviously women, as, as you know, carry a big responsibility to bring new life into this world. And in, in order to have the healthiest baby that has the best chance of surviving and passing on its genes to the next species, 
the woman should probably be in good shape. So the woman should have be full of nutrients, right? And the woman um, should not be in a situation where she's in danger. So whenever we have times of famine or war, um, obviously it's not beneficial for us to reproduce, to have children during wartime because there's a good chance that they wouldn't survive. And, uh, you know, if there, was a, if, if there was a zombie apocalypse, a pregnant woman would not be able to run as quickly as a woman who was not pregnant. So these are just some considerations to think about um, from going back to having an ancient body in present times. Um, during, uh, excuse me, during cave woman times, there were things that signaled our body that it was not a safe time to reproduce or create or be out in the world. And this was generally when there wasn't enough food around, when there were toxins around us, when we were infected, and when um, perhaps there was some danger. And so we sensed this. Now, um, the way this is translated into modern days is we see women who have had a history of sexual abuse, um, women who are in abusive relationships, battered woman syndrome. These women have alterations in their thyroid hormone profiles. They're more likely to have autoimmune disease. They're more likely to have thyroid antibodies. They're more likely to have fibromyalgia. Um, and, and that makes sense. It's like, okay, this is going to be a signal that this is not a good time to reproduce and I need, I need to survive. And then the other ways that we could send these same signals is through dieting, exercising too much, and eating stuff that our ancestors would not have considered food, right? And so if we're eating a lot of um, grass, which in our days has been turned into, into bread, that's not necessarily, that, that's going to send a signal to our body that there's nothing else to eat. And same with um, processed foods, we become nutrient depleted, then our body's saying, oh, you poor thing, you must be really hungry. I'm going to just, I'm going to help you out. I'm going to help you slow down the metabolism and hold on to these things for you. And then when you're not sleeping, you know, if you're not sleeping in modern days, it's like coffee and deadlines and, you know, whatever, you've got work to do. But in the olden days, you know, the only reason that you would be keeping up at night is if there was a dangerous situation. And so for me, it's like, what is happening in your life that is sending your body these danger signals? And how do you start sending safety signals? And that, that's how you really get to the core of uh, recovering from Hashimoto's. That's beautiful. And, and I just want to point out for everybody watching this that this paradigm that Isabella just presented is, is really like her own paradigm. It's her own realizations. And, and this is, in my opinion, just a brilliant piecing together of, of what's going on. And I, I think that this is a huge step forward in our general understanding of this condition and what's really going on. So I'm super excited about it. I just want to make sure that everyone here understands like how big of a shift in paradigm and how brilliant that really is. So thank you. I appreciate that. And I think it also gives this perspective to not think about the thyroid gland as an enemy, but as, as someone that's trying to help us. Right. Yeah, for sure. So um, let me see. Uh, you've worked with over a thousand people with Hashimoto's and I know that you figured out that you can accelerate healing and symptom reduction within one to two weeks, even for people who have been suffering for many, many years. So how, how do you actually do that? One of the things that I started doing with my clients when I first got my health back and it, it didn't take two weeks to get my health back, right? Is I started um, trying to figure out what the root causes were and I was doing a lot of functional medicine testing and kind of like doing the dig at it approach where we were going through and checking off boxes. And in some cases, this turned out to be expensive, labor intensive, and we weren't always seeing results right up front. And I also had this subset of clients who was like sensitive to everything. So I would say, hey, try this B vitamin. And they'd be like, it was horrible. I felt, I felt horrible. Like, and they were just these um, people that reacted to their environment. They reacted to supplements. Um, everything around them was, was just troublesome. And so I started thinking about, okay, how do I help these people? These are the things like, how do I do it faster and more efficiently? These are like the thoughts I have in my head all the time. And I thought, okay, well, there's going to be issues with the liver because when people have circulating immune complexes that are present in Hashimoto's where they're created against foods and against um, our own thyroid tissue, this kind of gets shunted to the liver. And then people with thyroid disease are less likely to sweat. 
And um, this is not a co common symptom they complain about, but when you're not sweating, then you're not getting rid of toxins and then the liver gets the extra burden. And then when you have the leaky gut that's present in every case of autoimmune condition, then all the, the toxins are also getting shunted to, back to the liver when the gut's not clearing them properly. And so we end up with the person with this liver backlog where um, I like to think of like a, you know, one of those government workers in a little office where she just has this like stack of papers and she's supposed to like process them all. And she keeps getting more and more stuff put on her desk and there's like cuts all around in the company. And she just can't, like it takes her like 16 weeks to process like one application that, that takes five minutes on her end, right? And this is like my idea of what's happening with the liver. And so what we do is we start taking away some of those piles and we start making her be more efficient so that we start clearing out some of that toxic backlog. And when I first started doing liver support with my clients, I found really like amazing and exciting things that surprised me because I wasn't with multiple chemical sensitivity. I, I just wasn't expecting much. I was like, wow, that, that's really tough. But once you start clearing out some of the toxins out of the liver, then the body sort of resets. And so um, one of my favorite stories that I have to tell is a woman who couldn't go to the mall because she was so chemically sensitive to the smells mm -hmm. that they have at like Abercrombie and the Yankee Candle and all those places that, you know, smell great to the average person, but if you're chemically sensitive, it's, it's you know, you're done. And she also had headaches. She had, um, she had um, headaches, like migraine headaches. She had joint pains, elevated thyroid antibodies, and, and just was sort of like her mood was down and she was very sluggish. And so we put her on the liver support protocol for two weeks. And within the first week, she like called and left me a message and said, you'll never, you'll never believe this, but I'm at the mall with my daughters shopping for the first time in years for Christmas. And she, um, she ended up having her headaches went away, her joint pains lessened, her yeah. um, mood got better. And then the next time we tested her thyroid antibodies, they were lower. Now, we still had to work more to get her um, antibodies in the remission range. But it was like, wow, that just happened within two weeks. Mm -hmm. So then, then I was like, okay, I'm going to do that for everybody. And then I started doing that in my program. And I used to work in outcomes research. And so this is another fun thing for me where I was testing everybody and asking them, like, what were your results with every intervention? Mm -hmm. And 65% of people felt better on the liver support. 65, you said? 65% within nice. the first two weeks. And there were people who were, like, working with functional medicine doctors who were working on their own. Like, these are, like, highly educated people that even read my first book, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that was, like, really, really exciting. And that's how the idea of my second book, Hashimoto's Protocol, was born, was based on this... Um, the fundamental things you need to do to restore your health, liver, adrenals, and gut. And then we go into like the advanced pro protocols that deal with individual triggers. Beautiful. So you've mentioned liver support. Yeah. What's involved in that and, and how does that differ from, you know, there's a lot of kind of like pseudoscience-y ideas out there around detoxing. And, right. and how would you differentiate, you know, what you're doing from, all that kind of mess of pseudoscience around detoxes. You know, with detoxes, they can be quite scary because um, in some cases, like let's say you think about this like backlogged <laughs> office worker and then you're like, let's detox, let's clean up your desk and you just get in there and you start like, you know, trying to clean things up and move things around. Like you'd create even more of a mess. Yeah. And that's what happens with these forceful detox methods like chelation, um, that pulls heavy metals from within our bodies. And then, you know, if our detox systems are working perfectly, then the heavy metals come out. If they're backlogged, then they just go somewhere else. And so this is um, one of the challenges. Um, and I did try this and didn't have the best reaction. So that's why it's not in any of my books to, to do stuff like that. And unless you've gone through the fundamentals, some people may still benefit later on. But um, the liver support is different because we're basically um, supporting your own body's natural processing. And so what we're doing is we're removing those, um, those additional stacks of paper from the desk. And how we do that is we're going to go through and think about your diet. So gluten dairy, gluten, dairy, and soy are out right away. And then we get off of processed foods. That's another thing that gets out. So then you're not getting all of these um, toxins, new toxins every day organic foods, so you're not getting pesticides. Um, so that's 
first part is removing foods. Then we're also removing toxins. Like, so like the low hanging fruit around you, what can you do? Like, obviously, you know, there's toxins everywhere in our environment and I'm all for cleaning up our environment, but let's start with your home, right? And so we're going to go and clean up your water supply. So remove fluoride. Fluoride is a thyroid suppressing substance and it's added to our water. So every time you're taking that sip of water, you're damaging your thyroid and you're suppressing its function. So reverse osmosis filter. Then we're looking at personal care products. Yeah. Oh, man. Sorry, I, if I can interrupt you just for a second, yeah, well, please I do. just want to emphasize what you just said because like so many people that I see still drink tap water or they drink like water filtered with a Brita or something like that. Even, even some people that I know that are even health conscious people are doing this. And it's just insane to me that people don't realize how much junk is in there. And, you know, fluoride being just one of many that can potentially disrupt thyroid function. But I just wanted to, to, to emphasize for people how important it is to drink pure water that doesn't have you know, things that disrupt, that are known to disrupt thyroid function in it, in every sip you take. Like that's just, I mean, that's just a huge factor. So I just want to make sure people get that. The, the crazy thing, Ari, is that the dosage used for suppressing thyroid hormones. So um, back in the day when we didn't have the thyroid suppressing drugs, they were using fluoride and the dosages that they were using this is what you would get if in the average American home if you drank six to eight cups wow. of water a day like a good girl or a good boy, you know, and followed your recommendations. Wow. So That's don't do good. it. <laughs> get nice. a filter or, you know, get a clean delivery source where they deliver clean water to your home. Yeah. And, you know, going through for women, other low-hanging fruit are your personal care products. So I recommend that, they, that women go on a two-week personal care product detox for, for people for some people, it's not, um, it's not an option, but when you think about all the creams and lotions um, from a pharmacologist standpoint, when you put this on your skin, it actually bypasses the liver, which helps you detoxify things and it gets directly into your bloodstream. Mm -hmm. And essentially, um, what you put on your skin is going to be potentially more harmful and toxic than you would take internally. Mm -hmm. And um, if women are not willing to give up their personal care products for two weeks, I say, okay, let's make sure that you go and clean up your personal care products. So there's versions that are much more cleaner and I recommend investing in them. I mean, really how often are women like, like I'll buy one lipstick and it lasts me three years. So you could spend an extra $5 and get a new lipstick because it'll last you so much longer and you won't have those toxic effects. Um, the EWG is a great source for figuring out what your level of toxicity is in your personal care products. I was, I was appalled when I found out like my favorite perfume, it's like a one to 10 scale was like at a nine. Whoa. And I was like putting this on my thyroid every day, putting this like, you know, on my neck, like on my, like all over my body. And I was like basically giving myself small doses of poison. Yeah. Yeah. I think I had read something recently about lead in being very common in lipstick as well. Yes, um, lupus. So they, this was a few years ago. They found that women who wear lipstick are more likely to have lupus. Oh, wow. And they suspect that it was the lead. Um, I personally, I have, one day I'll write a blog about this. I was like too angry to write about it at the time. But <laughs> I, um, I was once after getting myself into remission, I actually had a flare up because of my lip gloss, which contained arsenic in it. So every day I was applying this lip gloss. And I was like, the lips absorb so much. And I was like, um, I ended up with um, arsenic toxicity. I was losing my hair and having all these joint pains and all these rashes. Yeah. Um, and it was because of the lip gloss I was putting on, wow. on my, like, I was re reapplying, reapplying. Yeah, so, that, it's crazy. It's crazy how toxic of a world we now live in where all these things that are so common are potentially sources of of toxins, you know, our, our water, the things we use in our hair and on our skin. I mean, it's just, it's nuts. Um, so is there a particular diet that you recommend that you found helpful for people with Hashimoto's? Generally gluten-free, dairy-free, soy-free at a minimum. That's where I have everybody start. In some cases, I'll have them modify and start tailoring their diet. Um, a lot of people have benefited from the autoimmune paleo diet. 
I recommend it for people who have thyroid nodules, for people who have a lot of, you know, like a lot going on. So sometimes that might be a good starting point. Um, I always try to work with a person until we have a step up approach where you start off with gluten-free, dairy-free, soy-free, and then you remove more foods over time until you're symptom-free or, you know, at a good place. And then the step up, step down approach is when you remove the, all of the foods in the autoimmune paleo plan, and then you add more foods back in. Mm. Um, this, of course, one of the things that I often caution about is like diet is not the be all end all because if you are eating a clean diet and if you've hit a plateau, um, I would say give it three months before you start need to, before you need to investigate other things. My, um, my clients and people in my program who had a plateau with diet, 97% of them had, um, had the liver congestion issue based on an assessment. Um, 95% of them had low cortisol levels based on adrenal saliva testing. And then 80% of them had um, gut infection based on um, two tests that I did. So it's like you, you, all, you always want to consider those. Yes, diet, but I, I just don't want people to get into a place where they start losing more foods and then they start saying, okay, well, I just, you know, I'm pretty much eating water with ice cubes, right? For You've, you've seen those memes where yeah. it's like a plate with an ice cube, it's gluten free. Yeah. But yeah, we don't, I don't want people to be restricted for a long time. I'm not restricted now, so, um, you know, I avoid gluten, dairy, and soy, um, but I'm not, you know, I'm not like eating a limited amount of foods. We want people's worlds to get bigger, not to get smaller. Although having a restricted diet might be part of the healing process. We don't like, as soon as I see people losing more foods, it's like, okay, we need to jump in and make sure we're addressing the liver, adrenals, gut, potentially infections. Let's, let's find out what else is happening there. Yeah, for sure. And it's, it's always walking this balance between trying to identify and get rid of potentially problematic foods without creating this intense neuroticism and fear and anxiety uh, around, you know, toxic foods and which can often be potentially more harmful than the foods themselves. Cause yeah, there's, that sets off your stress response and then you're more likely to become sensitized to the foods, right? Yeah. Um, there's one, you know, one people who have had a history of eating disorders are more likely to have this kind of, um, you know, potential of, of, of becoming, I guess, orthorexic is the right word that I'm looking for, where they have an unhealthy, um, they have an unhealthy relationship with food where they're no longer tuned into their body and their food. And they get to a point where they're like, okay, if I just remove one more thing, then I'll be better. Or if I just am strict enough, then I'll be better. And, um, I, you know, like I said, people with history of eating disorders are more likely to have this happen to them, but it's, it's not just limited to that. So I personally never had a history of an eating disorder, but I got to a point where I, I became orthorexic when I was eating the, um, the GAPS diet, which is a wonderful diet for some people, but for me, it wasn't working. And um, I ended up finding out that I had copper toxicity and all the nuts on the diet were, were aggravating um, me and you know making me anxious and causing breakouts. But you want to be in a communication with your body. So like, don't necessarily listen to a dietary theory, but listen to what your body's saying. So if, if the way you're eating is causing you breakouts, then that means there's something happening and that's something you need to take away. Gotcha. But I so, digress. You know, we, don't, we don't have too much more time here, so I want to uh, just try and yeah. ask a couple more questions. Um, what do you think about nutrient deficiencies in the context of Hashimoto's? Are there some nutrient deficiencies that can contribute to the problem? Absolutely. So that's a very well-known root cause. And the most common nutrient deficiencies are going to be selenium, thiamine, vitamin D, B12, um, ferritin, as well as magnesium. So these are the things that I recommend looking into. Um, vitamin D, ferritin, B12, you want to test for. The other is I actually recommend supplementing with, um, regardless of doing a, a test that shows a deficiency, because you might still benefit. And most of them, you're not going to see them on a blood yeah. test. I, I think there was an impressive study on thiamine or, yeah. it was it thiamine or riboflavin. I know you've talked about it in relation to uh, the fatigue in people with Hashimoto's. Yeah. Thiamine is, um, to me, it's like one of the best things you can do for thyroid fatigue. 
when um, I was in pharmacy school, I was taught that thiamine deficiency was only in alcoholics, but that's the furthest thing from the truth. Um, truth is, like avert, like really high thiamine deficiency is going to be in alcoholics, but we can have subclinical thiamine deficiency when we have any kind of gut issues. So people with Hashimoto's, Crohn's disease, irritable bowel syndrome, they could be at risk for this. And the amazing thing is um, the studies showed 600 milligrams of thiamine helped a person recover from fatigue within three days. Um, I was one of those people that took thiamine and within three days, it was, it was amazing. Like I, um, I used to struggle with adrenal issues. I had blood pressure over 90, over 50. And then I would like for years, 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 years. And I would go to my doctor and I was already paleo then, I think. And she would be like, how are you even walking? Like <laughs> you should be in bed right now with that kind of blood pressure. I had blood sugar issues, carbohydrate intolerances, and um, a lot of fatigue and brain fog. And within three days, the thiamine just turned it around. I've had um, normal blood pressure ever since then. My digestion was improved. Um, thiamine also helps with digestion. And it was like, wow, I have energy now. And um, I wrote a blog post about it. it. It went kind of viral a few years ago. And I've had like people come up to me at conferences and like give me hugs. Um, they're like, thank you for your thiamine article. And I'm like, <laughs> who are you? <laughs> Do I know you? No, but yeah, I, I always appreciate hearing from readers that something I've recommended has been helpful. And this is one that I'm constantly getting feedback on. Um, last week, I had a woman who wrote in and said um, she was on disability before she started thiamine because she just had no energy. And then she started thiamine and all of a sudden, like not all of a sudden, but over time, she was able to go back to work. She first part time, and now she's working full time. And um, ultra, the benfotiamine by Benfo Max um, by Pure Encapsulations at 600 milligrams is the one I like to use, and that's um, something I have links to on Thyroid Pharmacist. But it's people can get from their practitioners or from um, anywhere on the uh, World Wide Web. Um, and that's the version that seems to work best for most people. And it might have some beneficial um, immune modulating properties, the benfotiamine version versus um, plain thiamine. Gotcha. So I know there are a number of other potential root causes we could go into. There's a, there's a whole bunch of them, you know, with uh, food sensitivities and leaky gut issues and infections and circadian rhythm and sleep and stress and, you know, all kinds of issues. Um, since we're limited on time, I want to ask you to just talk about one. Um, can you tell me a little about infections in Hashimoto's? Yeah, so infections can trigger Hashimoto's through a few different pathways. Molecular mimicry is one. And then um, the other one is going to be through um, if they're inside the thyroid gland through the bystander effect. But some of the more common ones are going to be Epstein-Barr virus, blastocystis hominis, um, H. pylori is very common. And then we're looking at various yeasts and small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And I've seen, you know, a whole host of various parasites that are in the gut and they lead to gut permeability. Um, I know there's studies that show that these kinds of parasites are also present in people with chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, and I'm not surprised to hear that. The good news is once we find them and we get rid of them, we start feeling better and we get, we get our energy back, digestion improves, antibodies reduce. Interesting. So you mentioned molecular mimicry. I, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm sure that maybe a few people know what that is, but can you just explain it real quick so people understand what that is and how it relates to autoimmune Hashimoto's? Yeah. So in very simple terms, it's the immune system. It recognizes a pathogen and the, the pathogen has like a protein structure that looks a certain way. And then that might be similar to the protein structure of like the thyroid gland or another part of our body. And so when the immune system attacks the infection, it also kind of creates like a memory or a snapshot of that structure. And I like to think of it as like, you know, walking around with an iPhone showing everybody else like this is the bad guy. And then the immune system ends up attacking our own cells because it's a case of mistaken identity. So it's like, you look like this infection, so I'm going to kill you, but it, you know, it, it's actually not the infection. The, the bystander effect is when the infection is within the thyroid gland and then the immune system tries to attack the infection and tries to blow up its home, which happens to be the thyroid gland. Interesting. Crazy stuff. So um, last question, probably the most important question. 
for anybody who's watching this who actually has Hashimoto's or suspects they have um, hypothyroidism, is there a cure? Is it possible to get Hashimoto's into remission? And, and if there's a cure, what is it? Mm. So technically there's no cure. And they'll say once you have Hashimoto's, you always have ha you'll always have Hashimoto's. But when you think about, we talked about the five stages. So the first stage of Hashimoto's is just having the genetic predisposition based on studies done in people who are exposed to Chernobyl. I would say at least 80% of us have that predisposition. So with a strong enough trigger, 80% um, of children within a certain age would develop Hashimoto's after being exposed. Wow. And so, you know, we're always going to have that. We can't change our genes, not yet, but we can change the genes expression. And so we can move back through the stages. We can get rid of all of the symptoms with the current therapies we have. We can reduce the autoimmune attack on the thyroid gland. One elegant thing you can do is measure thyroid antibodies to see if they're reducing they, they're not like the be all end all of how aggressive your immune system attack is, but they're one marker that can be helpful. And so we can reduce thyroid antibodies um, under 100, under 35, and some even to zero or one, which is you no longer have any antibodies. Um, under 100 is considered remission. And then we can also, in some cases, the person can potentially wean off of thyroid hormones. And so then they don't have symptoms, they don't have antibodies, and they don't need to take thyroid hormones. And for all intents and purposes, they don't have Hashimoto's, in my opinion. So I feel like there, it's a really great time to, um, for functional medicine, for what we're doing, the work that we're doing. It, it sounds kind of funny, but it's a good time to be a thyroid patient because there's so many options for us. Um, we didn't chat about this, but low-level laser therapy over the thyroid gland, about half of the people in three different studies we're able to get off of thyroid meds completely, and the other half we're able to um, to see a reduction in the need for thyroid hormones. So this is I know you're a big fan of light therapy, and, and this is just one of those amazing interventions we have in our pocket. And we combine that with all these fantastic tools and resources we have, we can really create a path back to wellness and take our life back. For sure. And, and I've seen it happen. I've, I've seen people go into remission. A lot of the people I've seen go into remission as a result of following your methods. So thank you so much for, yeah. for being here. Um, I want to just on a final note, just for anybody who's watching this who has thyroid conditions um, or suspects they might, where can they get more information from you? What is the best path? Because I know you have two books now. There's a documentary coming out. Um, or is, is out at this point. Um, so what is the best path that somebody should go on to heal themselves and fix their, their Hashimoto's? Um, so definitely come check in with me, go to thyroidpharmacist.com. And if you go to thyroidpharmacist.com slash gift, you'll be able to get access to some nutrient dense recipes, quick diet starting guide, and some of those quick nutrients that you can address so you can start feeling better right away. And um, yeah, this is what I do full time. I just specialize in Hashimoto's and helping people with this condition recover their health. So I have a new book called Hashimoto's Protocol that's coming out and it's based, based on my program um, that um, I think over 1,500, maybe 2,000 people have gone through now where we go through all of the things you need to do to recover your health, the fundamentals and then the advanced protocols. And yeah, I have a thyroid documentary called The Thyroid Secret just you know, come and see me. I'll take good care of you. <laughs> I've got a lot of things that I can help you with. And I'm always um, sharing the latest and greatest as well as the most, like the fastest ways back to your health. Because I'm, I'm like, how do, I, how do I make it more efficient, right? Awesome. Well, I've read The Root Cause. It's phenomenal. Um, I've also had a chance to have a sneak peek of the new documentary, which is also phenomenal. So uh, I'm sure the new book will be as well. And um, for everybody watching this, make sure you go check out that documentary right away. And Isabella, thank you so much for being on this call with me. It's been an absolute pleasure. And thank you for sharing your wisdom and brilliance on this subject with my audience. Oh, thank you so much, Ari. The pleasure has been all mine. It's truly an honor. And like I said, I love the work that you're doing in the world. And it's always fun to, to talk with a fellow health nerd. <laughs> Thanks so much, Isabella. Have a great night. You too.